I'm very excited to say that we have Lane Johnson and Mike Schrag. Schrag with us here today. They will both be speaking in their areas of expertise and we'll have a couple minutes for questions at the end. Um, Lane is the research forester with the University of Minnesota Cloquet Forestry Center. And Mike Schrag is the wildlife biologist for the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. So please welcome them as they're here to share with us what they know. Thanks for that introduction, Lacey. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, I was here last in 2018 to present on some ongoing tree ring based fire history work I've been involved with since uh, 2010, 2011. And uh, I have to say, this is a, a larger group. And so it's great to see that this event is growing in popularity. And I can assume that most of you are here to learn more about moose rather than listen to me talk. <laughs> But um, so what I'm gonna do is talk for about 20 minutes, just about kind of some general um, findings, observations on the ecological effects of the Bounty Creek fire, mostly related to vegetation and soils. And then Mike's gonna talk for about 20 minutes about um, moose uh, population monitoring that he's been involved with. And then we're gonna have time for group questions and discussion. I think a lot of you are super knowledgeable about the ecology of the area and are probably well equipped to um, provide some insights to the whole group. So I encourage that kind of, uh, that kind of conversation or two-way learning. So how many of you were here last month when we had a presentation from the Forest Service about the Bonami Creek Fire? Can you show of hands? So does anyone want to just throw out some, some words that come to mind after learning about that incident and how it was managed and uh, the fire behavior? Yeah. Wind, wind driven. Lakes aren't as safe to hide on as you thought maybe. Wind-driven fires suddenly make lakes unsafe to be on. Anything else? Fire creates its own climate. Yeah, fire can create its own localized weather. Um, pyrocumulus clouds, you have thunder, lightning, um, snow, hail, and things associated with um, the atmosphere conditions associated with uh, that type of energy release. So, um, I was down in the Twin Cities uh, in the middle of, of my grad school experience down there when the Pagami Creek fire happened. And I really felt like I, I missed out. Uh, I had been working for the Forest Service previously and in my first season not working um, with them, this big incident happened. And as a as kind of a fire geek, uh, I definitely uh, had a hard time watching from a distance. But I remember this Landsat imagery being released um, maybe October 10th or October 11th, uh, showing the, the footprint of the Bagani Creek fire. And I, I think this is just a, a classic uh, satellite image showing uh, the, the footprint of this fire within the Arrowhead region. You can see the, the deep blue of Lake Superior and the, the autumn colors in the Lake Superior Highlands along the North Shore. You can see in the the upper right corner, um, some of the burned areas from Cavity and Ham Lake fires in 2006, 2007. And you can see the, the size of uh, the Begami Creek footprint relative to the community of Ely. And this thing is just um, a big event. And I think for a lot of people that worked on the fire, we learned that um, it was really life-changing or really altered how people um, think about fire uh, in this landscape. So something that Carl and Tom talked about when they were here last month is just the, the different types of fire behavior that they saw. And so here's a, an image taken from Lake One, September 5th, uh, really more moderated fire behavior uh, early on in the incident. You have uh, some tree level scorching or pockets of jack pine that were crowning out. Um, but something that's kind of manageable within the, the range of variability that firefighters are used to in this, in this landscape and some good, uh, good benefits to this kind of fire. And then this is uh, some smoke coming up uh, 
during burnout operations the next day, you can see the smoke's relatively light um, and that there's uh, really achieving, I think a lot of the goals they had for, for um, kind of expanding the fire footprint, but also corralling the fire, creating some areas of black to, to manage the burn. And then uh, here, September 12th, the day that Pagami made its big run, this is taken on the, I believe the East End of Lake Insula. And you can see the difference in the, the character of the smoke and the flame heights and just how uh, the, the heat and the flames really dwarfs uh, the forest here. And so the first thing that came to mind is wind. So here's a wind-driven event, tons of fuel on the ground, and um, it's not a kind of fire that you fight, you just, you get out of the way. So I had the good fortune of uh, paddling through the Pagani Creek footprint uh, last fall on a recreational trip. And here's a photo uh, taken on Lake Insula 10 years later. And uh, it was a pretty dreary day and no one else really out in the water and was able to spend the entire day paddling into the wind and uh, kind of slowly moving through this burned out landscape and um, being really fascinated by the fire effects. And uh, I guess I left this day feeling like um, maybe I, for the first time I had like a real uh, classic high quality wilderness experience and that the, the forest conditions I was experiencing um, in this area is maybe what most closely resembles what this landscape looked like um, when Euro Europeans, Euro Americans first settled the area. I, I thought about um, some historical photos that uh, Lyndon Gerdes uh, mentioned to me that are in the University of Minnesota archives. This uh, University of Minnesota botanist, Ned Huff, who uh, paddled the, the Quishby River area, uh, turn of the century. I believe these photos are from the late 1890s. They're like lantern slides. But this is taken, uh, kind of considered to be, or the title of this photo is, is Moose, High Quality Moose Habitat on the North Quishby River. You can see this burned out um, forest scene. Here you can see a bunch of fire killed red pine, white pine on a, a bluff with uh, presumably a good vista from the top. And then uh, another view of a burned out bluff, but with um, living kind of individual red pine and white pine sea trees. So this, this is the Boundary Waters landscape that um, people first experienced when they came here and decided that this was a special place and wasn't um, always lush and green and, and forested. It was fire maintained. We can look at historical journals like the John McLaughlin Journal, uh, written around 1806. He described that in between um, Lake of the Woods and Lake Superior, that by the carelessness of the natives, the fire runs in every in some part of this country every year. It happens that the low grounds, by being moist, escape while the hills burn. He goes on to describe the soil conditions related to that. Ernest Oberholzer, uh, one of his paddling trips through the area, uh, went from the Basswood River um, to uh, Winton and says that it made the entire distance from about two miles below the entrance to the lake to Winton by seven in the evening. And Basswood Lake saw some Indians we had met two days before on Lac LaCroix, caught about a five pound pike and saw four forest fires around Basswood. And so it's just interesting to me that people kind of remark on a fire Kind of as an active process in this landscape, um, but as a regular as an occurrence as uh, wind, rain, sunshine, so on. And we know uh, through fire research, the work of Myron Heinzelman, you know, it's not just small fires, but uh, landscape scale events. And so here's uh, fires that he mapped that occurred across the Border Lakes region in 1863 and 64. Presumably, we know that uh, likely burned in 1862 and 1865 as well in the Trian record. But you can see how large of a, an area was consumed by fire in these years, and that, what the footprint of that fire is relative to um, relative to the Bagami Creek footprint. And so, by historical standards, Bagami Creek um, isn't really a large event, uh, but we can 
I guess, think about some of the fire effects within the footprint that are perhaps different today than they would have been in the past. We know from the treatment record, this is work that I've been involved with. We can uh, cut into remnant red pine trees. You can sand up the, the surface of those cross sections and get uh, annually and seasonally resolved fire uh, year dates um, that we can assign to uh, site specific or points in the landscape and then use to develop um, records of frequent fire that go back into the 1500s. So every single red arrow you see here uh, is a fire event recorded in the rings of a tree that uh, was damaged in a fire but survived and continued growing for many years. And uh, every single horizontal line is uh, the life of a single remnant red pine. You can see kind of that fire, non-lethal surface fire with a common occurrence in the red pine sites that we sampled here. And you can see that around 1900, with a change in land use activities and federal uh, fire suppression policies, you have uh, a widespread sort of absence or removal of fire. So uh, this change in fire occurrence, this change in frequent fire and change in, in uh, low severity fire, mixed severity fire, uh, has allowed for a lot of fuel to build up and we get events like the Bonami Creek fire. So uh, we can, I guess, think whether or not this is a, a natural event as a wildfire, or is it is it a man-made event? And it's a little bit of a both. Because this is the consequence of management decisions that have been made for, for decades. And so uh, Tom and uh, uh, Carl, is that right? Um, really talked about the, the amount of the Pagani Creek fire that burned in a large or a large area in a very short amount of time. So this entire area that's gold burned in a single day. And um, what we, we know from research following the fire using remotely sensed data, um, Landsat imagery pre and post that um, the fire severity across much of the, the fire footprint uh, was moderate to extreme meaning that you know, the majority of trees were lost. And we can look at uh, fire effects in the Greenwood fire, and we have fire severity maps for that, and it looks vastly different, but because that's um, using uh, or assessing, I guess, soil burn severity rather than um, forest burn severity. So this is me a measure of forest burn severity and, and forest change following the fire. And so it's quite possible that these large fires that occurred back in the 1860s, the 1890s, and, and really since time immemorial, um, fire was this self-maintaining or self-regulating process. And the amount of fire severity that we see within this fire footprint quite possibly um, is outside of the historical range of variation um, because of the amount of fuel that's been, that had accumulated within the fire footprint uh, over the 20th century. So uh, there's been a fair bit of research in the last 10 years assessing fire impacts. Um, I believe many of you probably have experiential knowledge for being within and around the Gami Creek footprint, what kind of fire effects um, or what kind of ecological effects are out there. Um, but we have the literature review that I was able to do. There's five peer reviewed publications, one technical report chapter and one dissertation chapter. And uh, there's one paper dedicated to vegetation response to growing seasons post fire. Uh, the dissertation chapter focuses on hydrological response um, to uh, the fire event. And, and uh, we have one paper dedicated to bird community response. And then we have three papers dedicated to kind of soil burn severity and emissions of soil carbon, nitrogen, mercury, and other nutrients. So we're, we've been learning a lot about this fire, but it's also interesting to me that there's been you know, so little research actually done in the last 10 years relative to some events out West. And I think some of that has to do with just the accessibility of the fire um, being in the wilderness and just hard to get to um, and kind of out of sight, out of mind in some cases. So from the research that's been done, um, I'm just trying to like give you a sense of what, what we're learning from that 
uh, the, that, those different projects. Uh, in 2013, they observed through remote sensing and ground truthing that there was patchy aspen regeneration two years post fire. Essentially, they determined that if there was aspen on these sites prior to the burn, they return uh, or they return as aspen post fire. And I think we're observing a similar patterns with, with jack pine and, and black spruce as well, that they have um, uh, reproductive traits that allow them to respond positively to high severity fire. Um, the dissertation, uh, the doctoral student determined that there was really no significant hydrological responses to high severity fire. Um, the, the potential post fire increases in water yield within the Kwishwi, uh basin or catchment uh, were really mitigated by the holding capacity of wetlands that, that didn't burn during the event. And uh, Ed Zolonis and others uh, observed quite a few different trends as far as bird populations, but something that stood out to me is that these high severity patches where we lost a lot of trees have become really good habitat for black bass woodpecker, house wren, and even eastern bluebird, which I understand is not something commonly seen up here. And as far as uh, soil impacts, this is by far where the most, most research search has occurred, which is kind of unusual, um, super fascinating, but also a bit over my head. Um, but uh, COCA, uh, folks with the Northern Research Station uh, and other partners, research partners determined that um, the amount of soil that was consumed during this fire, but there's a 94% decrease in forest, forest floor carbon um, uh, across the upland uh, portions of the fire, the fire footprint. 90% uh, decrease in, the, in forest floor nitrogen um, and a 94% decrease in forest, forest floor mercury. And so uh, really dramatic shifts because of the fire severity uh, in, in what uh, kind of uh, nutrients are present on the forest floor and basically large portions of both litter and duff and mineral soil were, were consumed in this event. And uh, something that they point out, which I find to be really interesting is that the, the trees that were killed in this fire uh, have become kind of stable pyrogenic uh, carbon that is going to become incorporated into the soil and can very well end up being like 70 percent of um, the forest floor carbon uh, that in the future. And so we, we lost a lot of carbon at these sites uh, during the event itself, but also created some sources of stable carbon that is going to be an important part of the system down the road and kind of in, increase the productivity of these sites uh, for certain tree species. So here's a picture I took uh, in April 2015. You can see the jack pines about, about knee high. And then this is how the jack pines looking as of last year. And I, I find paddling through these areas and seeing this type of jack pine regeneration to be really encouraging. And of course, in other areas you have something we're all familiar with probably, really thick aspen and birch regeneration. And you can see, um, looking at aerial imagery for the entire area, that there's um, kind of these areas of darker red within the fire footprint. I'm interpreting those to be large areas where there's um, really thick, dense uh, jack pine regeneration. And these, these lighter areas, uh, lighter red, um, are areas where aspen regeneration is really abundant. And maybe someone here is able to interpret what these um, areas that are showing up as gray are whether that's more shrubland or if that's a different forest type that I'm not quite a different mix of tree species. And there's been some great um, photography done by different different artists or people that have connections to this landscape for different reasons. So Regina Flanagan's one person who I've been admiring her photography online. So here's a, a photo series from the Island River uh, on the south end of the Pagami footprint, closer to Isabella Lake. And you can see that even sites where um, you know tree and soil uh, 
mortality was really high. We have this really impressive um, herbaceous response to the fire of uh, grasses, forbs, sedges, and, and shrubs coming in and uh, producing early successional habitat that's good for a variety of different species. Uh, and then uh, I think overall, what the take home that I have with, with the lit review that I did is that the system is really resilient to, to high severity fires, able to respond and recover uh, to these big types of um, fire events. But uh, I guess a word of caution is that not all um, species are well equipped to kind of withstand and recover from these high severity events. So there's a lot of um, kind of patches of white pine out there that uh, look like this and are not going to be contributing to the, the future forest. Um, that white pine, red pine tend to do best in low to mixed severity fire environments and Pagami just did not offer that because of the, the fuel loads that are out there. So here's a, another view from the Lake Three, a lot of overstory or super canopy white pine that were killed off. Another view from Lake Three. So I guess this is something that we can we can ponder. Is, is, is these types of ecological losses is something that we're we're willing to accept or we're we're comfortable with, and we can talk about that more at the end. Um, but I guess my hope uh, is that we can all be a bit more like uh, these guys that are paddling out uh, of Lake One uh, during the Pagani Creek incident. You can see that there's a uh, fire kind of burning in the background. They all seem really relaxed. They're trolling for fish. And uh, this is part of their, I guess, wilderness experience. And so uh, it's, it's my hope that in future years, you know, we can take the lessons learned from the Pagani Creek event and be more comfortable uh, with having this kind of fire uh, back on the landscape. So with that, I'll pass it on to Mike. What was coming in under the dead white pine? Uh, I think a, a real mix of, I didn't go up there and look, but from a distance, it looked like it's a, a nice mix of like aspen birch and jack pine. So, so what Becky's wondering is if the forest regeneration that we're seeing out there is reflective of the kind of the new climate um, regime that we're in right now, uh, kind of a warmer and more variable um, moisture regime. And uh, I would say uh, the jury's still out on that one. I, I spent very little time in the, the footprint of the Gaumi Creek Fire, to be honest. So personally, I, I can't provide any observations related to that that I would feel confident sharing. Um, but I think we'll have a strong sense of how, how that's going to play out over the coming years. And as we, we do more robust assessments as far as uh, the vegetation that's out there um, using, you know, LIDAR and other, uh, I guess, newly available remotely sensed methods. And as the, the forest matures into from kind of young, early successional to something a bit more um, team-like, I guess, middle age. All right, well, thank you, Lane. And uh, that was a good introduction, I think, to my talk. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to come and talk about uh, what we're seeing as far as um, how moose are uh, responding to the Pagami Creek fire and uh, to some other large fires that we've experienced um, recently in Minnesota. Um, I, I think Lane was asking uh, earlier about, you know, making sure you were when the Pagami fire burned. I was in Menominee, Wisconsin, um, and walked out into the parking lot the morning after the fire blew up and smelled smoke. And, huh wonder where that smoke is coming from and then turned on the news and was like, oh, that's where it's coming from. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a huge event and you could smell it in central Wisconsin. Um, oh, and, and uh, this is a, a picture of, of moose um, from about the northern edge of the Pagami Creek burn. Um, I think there's, there's a sixth animal up here. I think there was actually a total of eight in that group. Uh, no. 
There we go. Okay, um, so moose and fire. Um, moose respond well to fire. Uh, this has been well documented over the years, uh, places like Isle Royal, um, up in Alaska, and in Minnesota on the Little Indian Sioux fire. Um, what happens is moose are selecting for a young forest with uh, the highest density of biomass and quality of forage. And this is what happens in younger forests uh, tend to have higher biomass, um, or at least a high density and, and biomass and the quality of the forage is also at its highest level um, in younger plants. And in younger forests, it's still within reach of moose. Um, you know, by the time Aspen is 50 years old, it's grown out of the reach of moose. But in those younger ages, moose can still get at it. Um, and for moose and other wildlife, when they exist in good habitat, their, uh, their survival rates and reproductive rates uh, tend to be higher. And as a population, they do better. Um, if we look at the major foods of moose uh, from northern Minnesota, um, paper birch, quaking aspen, uh, maples, cherry, willow, juneberry, and red, red osier dogwood, um, most of these species, what they have in common is they do well in uh, full sunlight. Um, so the sort of sort of conditions you'd find in a uh, following a fire when the canopy has been removed. Other habitat needs for moose, um, summer thermal cover, place where they can go to cool off in the heat of the summer. Uh, winter cover, which can uh, provide uh, snow intercept or also in, um, and, and actually for moose, unlike deer, it's, it's kind of the opposite. Moose don't need a whole lot of protection from cold temperatures, but they need some relief from even in January is warm temperatures. Uh, and for moose, uh, 20 degrees counts as warm. Um, so they may be going into the shade to cool off in January. Um, hiding cover is also a need for moose and other wildlife. Um, protect their calves, hide from predators, things like that. Um, and a large fire potentially um, can provide a good juxtaposition of that food and cover. Uh, fires, when they burn, they tend to leave a lot of skips. Um, so there's areas of burn and unburn. So a moose doesn't have to walk very far from its hiding place to find a lot to eat. So um, issue, uh, habitat as we know is fundamental to wildlife populations. They need a good place to live if they're gonna do well. Um, in Minnesota, we had a recent experience of large habitat changes for moose. Um, and wildlife managers like myself, we need to know how to allocate scarce time and resources, dollars, to have the greatest impact on moose. Um, we would like to understand moose response to large habitat changes, um, not just a snapshot, but over time, because in year one, it's likely to be different than year 20. Uh, and the public media managers want to know local impacts. You guys didn't invite me here to hear about moose response to fires on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. You want to know about moose response to the Kami Creek. Um, and that's fair. I mean, it's local, it's our backyard. And often, you know, just because moose respond one way to fire in Alaska, um, conditions are different here, they may respond differently. Um, and from a wildlife standpoint, we have limited dollars and resources oftentimes for long-term monitoring. We're great at funding two years master projects, um, but funding a 20-year research project doesn't happen that often. Um, and our moose population survey, um, while I think it's state-of-the-art for estimating moose numbers, is not designed to take consistent looks at the same piece of ground year after year. Um, just, and I'll get more into details of that. Um, so um, if, if we look at how we had our loose survey design, um, it's what we call a stratified random sample. All right, I'm gonna geek out a little bit here on statistics, so bear with me. Um, Basically, we had three strata of uh, low, medium, and high expected moose densities. Um, and we had Minnesota's Northeast Moose Range divided into 436 rectangular plots. 
um, that were all about 13.3 square miles in size and then stratified as low, medium, or high density. Um, and we, what we do is we draw a random sample from each of those strata uh, when we do our population estimate. Um, it's, you know, different, say, for uh, like the U.S. Census, where they try to count every individual. We're trying to estimate the population by, um, by sampling. Um, we, we aim for a consistent start early January with eight inches of snow on the ground. Um, we're using two Minnesota DNR helicopters with two observers and a pilot in each helicopter. Um, and prior to implementing our current habitat survey, we were generally flying 36 to 43 randomly selected plots. Um, so that's about 10% of the total survey plots. So um, maybe you can see the issue here is even a large event like the Bagami Creek fire, um, and while it impacts a number of our moose survey plots, in terms of the total number of plots on the landscape, uh, the chances of a plot over the Pagami Creek fire being drawn any year in a random survey is low and even lower to fly that same plot again the following year or the year after that. Um, what we're showing here, the red is our low density moose plots, the blue is medium density, and the green is high density moose plots. So we're drawing a select a random selection of plots from each of those three different strata to do our moose survey. So um, how did we come up with this moose habitat survey idea? Uh, really, it was the Pagami Creek fire that said, you know, we really need to start looking at these big habitat changes and how they're impacting moose because we believe that they are going to have an impact on moose. Um, at 144 square miles, it was the biggest Minnesota wildfire since 1931. Um, and we got lots of questions from the media, from the public, what is the impact of this fire going to be on moose? Because people generally have an idea that fire is good for moose, um, and, and moose are iconic in northern Minnesota. So there, we got a lot of questions about what the uh, impacts were going to be. Um, and this fire really led to the formation of how do we do a habitat survey to see how these big changes are impacting moose? Um, at the time of the fire, uh, I think uh, most of the burn area was older conifer dom dominated forest. Um, and it was mostly low density moose habitat. Um, by our method um, of scoring low density, that would work out to about zero to two moose per 13 square miles. So um, objectives of our populations or our habitat survey, um, detect moose response to large changes in habitat over time. And we said 20 years is a good window to do this. Um, and be able to make future predictions about similar changes with more confidence. And improve decision-making regarding where and how to prioritize funding and effort for doing moose habitat work. Um, so what we wound up doing, um, again, because of limited resources to put into a moose study like this, is we piggyback the habitat survey onto the existing annual moose population survey, uh, utilizing the same techniques and the same survey plots that already existed. Um, it was a state, tribal, federal partnership, um, working with biologists from all uh, four different agencies to design this study and come up with a little bit of extra funding to do it. Uh, helicopters are expensive. We're currently paying about 800 bucks an hour to fly them. Um, what we wound up doing was uh, incorporating the, the observation data um, from our habitat survey into the population. So this was, this was a win for us, is that we could still use the data on this habitat survey to help us estimate moose populations. And so this made the bean counters happy. We did that using a fourth stratum. So we got our low, medium, and high density strata. Now we're going to incorporate a fourth strata um, where we're not caring about density. It's just a fourth strata um, where that data then is added into our population estimate. 
Um, so what we have is a mix of randomly drawn plots from the three strata, low, medium, high density, plus our call them permanent or not really permanent long-term, maybe is better, um, habitat plots from this fourth strata. Uh, we came up with three different habitat treatment types that we wanted to track, one being wildfire, um, and then prescribed fire, and then timber management. It's the three different kinds of habitat changes we wanted to monitor with this. I'm mostly going to talk about wildfire, a little bit of the prescribed burning, uh, timber management. I'm leaving out of this talk in the interest of time, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. And we wound up with three to four plots in each kind of treatment. And started this survey in January of 2012. Um, so selecting plots for this survey. Um, well, our plots were already laid out. So it was kind of looking at the, uh, the Pagami Creek fire, you know, which plots in our moose survey were significantly impacted by the fire. And maybe there's six here where most of the plot was burned up. Um, and then is there pre-treatment survey data on any of those impacted plots? So we can compare before and after. In this case of the plots that were mostly incorporated by the fire, only one of them, plot 262, had any pre-fire um, observation data of moves. And that, again, is an artifact of having a random uh, selection of plots to estimate moose numbers, is we just didn't have a lot of data before the fire, um, other than anecdotal observations flying over the top of it on the way to somewhere else as, as to what kind of moose country it was. Uh, we were also aiming for a geographic diversity with this habitat survey across our moose range. Um, so what we came up with um, are three different types of treatments. Uh, this is the Trout Lake prescribed fire. Um, this is the uh, Tim, uh, oh, shoot, Twin, Twin Mitchell um, area here, just the Southwest of Ely, which is most uh, forest management area, a mix of county and state sales. Um, down here is a Beaver River uh, uh, timber sale um, uh, initiated by the Forest Service. Here's the Greenwood fire here, uh, Pagami Creek. This is the Keck Spider prescribed fire, Cavity Lake, Ham Lake wildfires. Um, this is the Lima Green timber management area in uh, north of Grand Moraine. And then this is a Duncan Lake prescribed burn, which we're still waiting for the Forest Service to ignite. Uh, we got a lot of pre-treatment data now on that one. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry. So results um, from our Pagani Creek plot, that 262 that I showed you earlier, um, the red bars are observations from that habitat plot. The green bars are the average of all our other high-density plots from that given year. So I think the way to look at this is, Here's the, uh, the data from the Pagami Creek fire versus the best of the rest across Moose Ranch. Um, here's when the, the fire burned in 2011. We had only one year of pre-fire data. Um, again, not a lot of moose. Um, our first survey was January 2012. Following the fire, we saw one moose and I'm confident that animal was lost because for the next three years, we didn't see any moose over, the, over our Pagani plot. Um, in fact, flying back and forth over that plot, which we do a lot on our way to Grand Marais, um, there were almost no tracks in the middle of winter across the Pagani Creek fire. I mean, like even otter tracks were hard to find. Um, but uh, in 2016, it was like somebody flipped a switch. Uh, and I think what happened is the recovering vegetation finally got tall enough to poke up above the snow line. So now in January, it's available to moose. And they really turned on uh, 10 animals that year. And it's been a good moose plot ever since. Um, very comparable with our other high density moose area. Um, here's an aerial view of um, uh, part of the Pagami Creek fire. 
Um, you can see uh, probably more deciduous regeneration, and then the darker green is conifer. Most of that is jack pine. Um, at least that's what it looks like from the air. Um, I think this is, and I'll get more into this. So um, in the next slide, very little of the our survey plot over the Pagami fire was impacted by the 1999 blowdown. Um, so this plot really had one disturbance, and that was the fire, the Pagami Creek fire. Um, as a result, compared to some of our other uh, fire plots, it's really coming back heavy to conifer, um, and particularly jack pine. Uh, so I think for the time being, here's another look at that. Um, this is all jack pine regeneration. Um, I, I'm glad Lane, Lane likes to see this jack pine regeneration. As a moose manager, I'd like to set it on fire again. Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, jack pine is, I know it's important, but it's not moose habitat. And as this jack pine matures, I think the Pagami Creek fire um, in over much of that fire is going to rapidly decline as quality moose habitat. Moose are not foraging on jack pine, and there's not much for them to eat underneath a maturing jack pine stem. Um, so I, I, my prediction is we're going to see a good moose response for a while over Pagami Creek, but it's going to decline fairly rapidly. And that's just because of the trajectory the vegetation is on. Now, if the Pagami Creek fire burns again, or parts of it, before that jack pine matures and sets another seed crop, that's going to set it back to more of a deciduous forest and better long-term moose habitat. Um, so we're going to compare the results of our Pagani fire um, with our Cavity Lake plot. Um, fire burned in, um, I think my line got bumped here because it was 2006. Um, there were some moose in the area uh, prior to the fire. This cavity, I think something to keep in mind here, again, the red are the observations on the Cavity plot versus all our other good plots that year. 30, 40% of our cavity plot is seagull and alpine lake. Um, it's lake ice, it's not moose habitat. And yet it's producing almost four moose per square mile this year. I mean, that's insane for moose density. Um, it, it consistently has been one of our better moose plots. I think the other thing to keep in mind is we have, we had half as many moose in Minnesota in these years as we did back here. Um, so I, I think what's different, come to our next slide. So here's, here's a view of the, the Cavity Lake fire looking towards Seagull Lake here in the background. Um, what happened on our Cavity Lake plot is most of this plot was blown down by, in the 1999 storm. So all those mature conifer and aspen and birch landed on the ground. And then the fire came along in 2006. It eliminated most of the conifer. And what's coming back is dominated by deciduous species. And if I was designing moose habitat, this is what it would look like. Um, patches of surviving mature forest, and that's patches of conifer for cover, followed by big patches of open area dominated by deciduous vegetation. We see not quite as dramatic, but very similar results on the neighboring Ham Lake plot. Um, now again, here's our, our pre-fire um, back here. Um, yeah, they never have had as high a numbers as we have had on Cavity, um, but consistently a very top performing moose plot. And again, this is blowdown followed by fire. Um, the terrain here is much hillier. Uh, so I think there were more pockets of surviving trees, both from the blowdown and the fire. Um, it's a little more rugged. Um, you know, I mean, there could be various reasons for, for the number of moose, but overall it is a very good moose plot. 
Um, we decided to set up a plot this January, this past January, over the Greenwood fire, um, partly because, or primarily because it was the only big fire in recent times that's been outside the boundary waters, and there's a high percentage of private land uh, within our moose survey plot. So we thought, you know, what happens with the, the vegetation at following the fire could be different than what we're watching in the boundary waters. Uh, you know, certainly a lot more uh, forest management options outside of the boundary waters than inside it. So we were curious to see how that happens. Um, you know, back in the 90s, this part of the uh, moose range used to be a pretty good uh, producer of moose, um, but uh, we've had two, two plot surveys over this plot um, in recent times, only one moose in one of those years wasn't surveyed here. Uh, we not surprisingly did not see any moose in January of, of this year following the fire. There's just nothing there for them to eat until that vegetation starts to recover. Um, by random chance, we had two other plots over the Greenwood fire this past winter. Um, so we had a total of three plots over the Greenwood fire. Between all three plots, no moose and one deer. Um, so, and, and I'm not surprised by that. Um, but this is look a uh, air photo of the Greenwood fire. I'm, I would like to think this is going to turn into a good moose producer in years to come. Um, again, it's a nice patchwork of surviving cover for moose and big patches of um, open areas that'll create moose forage. How long that forage lasts depends on what the vegetation is that's coming up underneath there, depends on what we plant in those areas or don't plant, things like that. But it will be interesting to see how that um, happens. Um, here's looking at a prescribed burn, a uh, Keck spider burn. Um, we didn't have, unfortunately, any pre-fire data to look at, um, but this has also been a good producer of, of moose. Um, not outstanding, but very solid. Um, this is also a combination of blowdown followed by the prescribed fire that was meant to, that was set to reduce some of those blowdown fuels. Um, and again, it's producing some good moose habitat. Here's a picture of the so here's Kekikabic Lake, and the Keck spider is um, around the lake. You can see our, our moose observations for um, this. Uh, five-year period in here, every one of those observation is inside the burn perimeter. Um, there's big chunks of our survey plot that are outside the fire. The moose don't want to be there. They want to be in the burn. Um, so whatever it is in the burn, and I think it's mostly forage, um, that's what's attractive. That's where they want to be. Um, another way we can look at changes, um, this is how we stratified the area of the Pecani Creek fire for moose density prior to the fire. Um, bulk of it was low density moose habitat, a little bit of uh, uh, medium densities uh, south of Insula Lake. Following the fire, based on the results from our habitat survey, as well as other random plots that we picked up over the fire, um, now that fire area is all medium or high density. If we were going to make our habitat plot a color, it would be green for high density. Um, how long that lasts remains to be seen. Um, my prediction is over large chunks of the Pagani fire, it will decline rapidly as that jack pine matures. Uh, so conclusions, um, and here's another uh, shot of a Pagani moose family from the way they were acting. That's a cow in front with her twin calves. And that's a young spike bull hanging with her. Uh, we all guess that was probably her calf from the year before. Um, we have 11 years of nearly continuous annual looks at the same survey plots. It would have been continuous, but COVID messed us up like it did a lot of things in 2021. We didn't fly. Um, fire is good from a moose standpoint. Um, it sets back the forest to those early successional stages that are preferred by moose. In addition, depending on the timing of the fire, I think there are also benefits to moose in that it will reduce winter tick populations. Winter ticks are a parasite of moose. It's also likely to burn up the snails and slugs that carry the brainworm parasite um, that can be lethal to moose. Again, though, that depends on the timing of the fire. 
Um, I think from our results, from a moose standpoint, big fire is better, creates a lot more habitat. Um, and two disturbances, such as blowdown followed by fire, or it could be fire followed by fire, um, or timber harvest, or uh, basically two disturbances is better yet from a moose standpoint, because it will probably set the vegetation on a course um, that leans more heavily deciduous and creates a lot more moose forage. Um, our timber harvest, again, I didn't get into those um, results in here. Um, those plots we're looking at, it's harder to tell what impact it's having. It could just be um, there's not enough timber harvest um, or the vegetation following that harvest hasn't gotten going yet to the point where moose has responded yet. Um, so it's, it's something we'll be looking at years to come. Oh, um, thank you to the uh, various folks I fly the survey with and uh, the agencies on the and 1854 Treaty Authority, Minnesota DNR and the Forest Service that have uh, contributed to this. Verbalize at least one question from the Zoom. We'll open it up to questions for a couple of moments. I don't know if y'all need to boogie. It is one o'clock, but um, I recognize if people need to head out, you're welcome to do that, but we'll hang on for just a little bit for questions. There was someone online who asked, um, Mike, for you to predict whether you think in the coming years people might be more likely to see moose along highways one and two. I hope so. Um, I mean, I, I used to send people, you know, drive up Highway 1 through Finland, Murphy City, and around by Isabella and back down if you want to see a moose. Mm -hmm. um, I remember those days, and you could just about count on doing it. And that hasn't been the case for 15 years or so now. So I, I would be hopeful that the Greenwood fire would um, provide some good moose habitat, and that'll be good a good place to look for moose in years to come. It'll probably take a few years for the vegetation to respond to the point where moose want to be there, at least in the winter time. You started your survey with a low, medium, and high density set of plots. Um, so you obviously had some reason to categorize those plots. I'm curious about how you started. And then second, I'm wondering if you did an overlay of those plots with any of Vlad Heinzelman's maps of the historic uh, fire regime over the area. Um, yeah, I, I might re reveal too much about how wildlife management really works here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it looks good to me. Um, <laughs> a, a lot, really a lot of it Okay, so some of it is based on previous results, um, whether from previous surveys or we know back when there was more hunter harvest. Okay, hunters are taking a lot of moose out of this area. It's probably a good moose area. A lot of it also was local knowledge. Um, some of you probably know Dan Litchfield, probably remember Fred Toonhorse, long-term uh, DNR wildlife employees here. Um, Fred had been flying moose surveys for years. Dan said he had like 30 years under his belt when he retired. They knew what a lot of that country looked like. And for many years, it was done with the Forest Service pilots who also were flying that country every day. Um, so we had a lot of experience on, yeah, this is a good moose area. This is not a good moose area. We also get burned every year with, well, we thought it was going to be a good area. Um, so it, yeah, it, it's, we do use overlays of timber harvest fires. Um, we, I don't remember we ever went back and used anything uh, like from Bud Heinzelman, um, but probably more recent timber sale and, and fire information, things like that. We have another question over here. I just had a question about reproductive success in these different burn areas and how you're tracking that you know, density versus actual total number. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that's a very good question because we can count moose, um, but we don't know, are they actually living longer or are they having more calves um, and those calves are growing up? That would require a different study. So we're inferring that it's good. Um, and I, I think, and I haven't ever 
really have made the time to go in and look at the numbers, but I think we are seeing more cow-calf pairs in these big fires. Um, so that tells me there's something there that is attractive to that cow to bring her calf there. Um, but yeah, what really ought to be done and hasn't been done um, is a study of moose, say with access to the Pagani Creek or the Cavity Fire versus moose that don't and compare their reproductive su success, lifespan, things like that. And that would really get you into the weeds as to, is it better? Um, you know, or are you just drawing moose from other places to come there? So we're making inferences. We see a lot of moose. It must be good for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. But uh, just a quick follow-up question. Are you reporting if they're adults or calves? Yes. So that, that study could mm -hmm. potentially be done. Yeah, and we record every time we see an antler fall off, too, for future reference. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the hand over here. I see that one back there. I'm going to stop. We've received information uh, recently that our anecdotal sense of more, more, more wind is in fact the case, especially in the winter. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems like there's more and more downfall events. Uh, do you quite understand how when a fire comes in an area that has a lot of downfall, uh, why that inhibits uh, certain kinds of trees, the, the, pine, the pines and so on to come back? So, so the uh, maybe Lane, do you want to take that? All right, go. It, could, it depends a little bit on the species, but uh, red and white pine, you need to have a living a tree source on a site uh, to offer that seed. Um, and so, if you have trees that are blown down or, or burned, and then the site burns again, um, you're going to kind of favor hardwoods, so aspen, birch. Uh, a lot of the forage species that, that Mike brought up. And so, uh, yeah, Mike was saying, yeah, pear disturbance is great for, for creating quality moose habitat. It's not necessarily so great for promoting pine. And I guess it depends a little bit on the specifics of the species. Jack pine might be a little bit more favored in a low down setting if it's um, kind of a, a rapid one two punch with disturbances. So, hopefully, that helps. Yeah. Um, and adding to that, a lot of the deciduous species, um, you can cut the tree down and they'll stump sprout, um, or their seeds will come in on the wind. Conifer seeds are too heavy that they have to be carried in by the squirrels. That takes a longer time. How far are you seeing moose stray from that burn edge into the interior of the Pagami burn? A long ways, like like it's a surprise. Like holy cow, I thought they needed to hang closer to cover. And it's not just mature bulls; it's oftentimes it's cows and calves. Um, so again, I, there's something in there that is worth it for them to walk out into that big open burn where supposedly they're more exposed to wolves or whatnot, um, and, and and get at the stuff. But yeah, they're walking a long ways from any edge. So unlike cavity and ham, there's not much edge in the interior of the Pagani. A very engaged audience today. Thank you. I'm just wondering what you can say about the value of the understory. I mean, you made, had your list in the beginning of dogwoods, mountain maple, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if Alder has any value, but it seems like um, things like aspen birch even grow fairly quickly out of reach. So what's the What's the deciduous value of those understory species to moose? Um, so, and, and we're, we're talking more like forbs and grasses or, or woody, woody shrubs. Um, Willow. Yeah. Um, Bruce thought that at the Highway 1 fire, for example, besides the aspen there's a lot of shrub tree growth. You know, I, I, I drew that list from a, a diet study that had been the NRI conducted here in Minnesota, um, and it certainly was not a comprehensive list. I think these were the top species that turned up in, um, with moose browse on them, but, you know, it, any list of plants that moose will browse would be a long list. Um, they have their favorites, but they will eat a lot of different stuff. Um, balsam fir is one thing they'll nibble on in the wintertime. Um, 
you know, I, for a lot of ungulates, deer, moose, um, there's other studies have documented that they do well in the early stages of forest succession. Um, and then in the middle years, uh, when the, the, you know, say aspen, for instance, is thick and dense, and there's much less growing underneath that, the value to those species, deer, moose, goes way down. Um, but then as you get into the older age classes now, and these stands start to break up, there's more sunlight on the floor, there's more diversity, then, then the use by deer and moose comes back up in those stands. Hope that maybe gets it at your question. Thanks. In your uh, map of the study plots early on, most of the high density plots were immediately adjacent to each other or very nearby, but there were three or four that were really quite remote uh, from other high density plots. And I wonder if you have any idea what the characteristics of those areas, those small areas were resulted in high density. Um, it, I don't know. Um, in some cases, it could be an artifact of we just haven't flown that plot in a while. Um, and, you know, next time, you know, yeah, it might really be medium density. Um, you know, sometimes there's just, there's a critical mass of cutover or a smaller fire or something that makes that area really attractive. Um, but yeah, I mean, on the list of things I, I you know, I, I wish somebody would get at, um, it's probably not going to be me, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, you can have neighboring plots. Well, why is this low density and this is high density? And I don't think it's always the vegetation. Um, I think sometimes it's it's soil productivity and, and some you know more nuanced stuff. The moose know the difference, but we are not seeing what they're sensing. Yes, uh, 50 years ago, uh, the southern part of the Monte uh, Creek fire, there was approximately five moose per square mile. What happened there? Forest grew up. Um, yeah, it, you're, you might, uh, maybe you're familiar with Jim Peake's study um, in, in the early 1970s, who's looking at moose response to forest vegetation. Um, and yeah, his study area was what was forest center and the southern edge of the, um, the, the Pagami Creek fire. And he had phenomenal moose numbers. Um, you know, wolf control back then may have helped, uh, but the forest had recently been logged. And if you look at pictures, and there's some pictures in his monograph of what the forest looked like, it's like, holy cow, that's like the picture of that cavity lake fire. I mean, I could not design better moose habitat. Um, it looks like a mangy dog with patches of, of you know, standing cover and, and everything else slicked off. And, and the moose were there in very high numbers. Then the forest grew up um, and there, you know, became wilderness. There was no further timber harvest in there, no fire. And it was, I think, in that stage where it was so dense and so conifer dominated that there just was not much there to be attractive for moose. It sounds like 25 years and it's kind of a, when we really start to see the moose numbers go down about 25 to 30 years after some major disturbance. Of course there's timings and that's why you were saying like two hits blow down or harvest with a fire or two fires. Like if we had a couple starts in the Pagami that we're allowed to uh, be managed to knock off some of this um, jack mine, especially before I had viable seed, and turn into a brushy area that would maybe maintain moose even longer. Uh, yeah, I think it would. And so like 25, 30 years, and then it needs another disturbance for moose. That, that's our prediction. Hopefully we're still doing this in 25 and 30 years and we can actually bring you some data. But yeah, that, that is the um, conventional wisdom is that at about 20 to 30 years or so that the, the stands close up enough that they're, uh, they, they start to lose their value to moose. All right, we'll do one last question. Thank you so much guys for hanging out. Um, this is a question for Lane. You threw out sort of a provocative question at the end of your talk um, when you talked about areas of severe fire burn where uh, mature red light pines did not survive the fire 
pine cones did not survive the fire, so there's no seed stock. This isn't Monty Python where a robin's going to fly in with pine seeds. Swallows. Swallows. With swallows. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, in the wilderness, we can't plant seedlings, right? And so I, it, when you threw out the question about the loss of our dearly beloved red and white pines in certain areas of the wilderness without mature trees, seed stock, or new trees, um, where were you thinking of taking the conversation? Sort of a natural versus wild conversation, or what were you thinking of, Lane? I'm glad you picked up on that. I was hoping uh, that's something that people could take away from uh, the presentation. Um, I, I would say, it's more of a kind of hint that we should be thinking about how some of these other uh, portions of the wilderness are getting managed with fire or not getting managed with fire, um, that we can be you know, proactively uh, and getting prescribed fire, fire into areas where we want to promote uh, the retention of long-lived conifers like red pine and white pine. So maybe we, we aren't able to go in and uh, kind of restock, uh, reseed or artificially regenerate some of these sites that burned hot that used to have white pine, but got, uh, you know, the other 90% of the wilderness uh, where we can be thinking about um, the forest cover that's there and how it might respond to the fuel loads that are there in a, a high fire danger sort of scenario, and um, perhaps be a bit more proactive with getting fire in there uh, when we can get more moderate um, fire behavior, and that would be Good for maintaining the diversity of um, overstory trees, those long lived converse that many people seem to appreciate. Um, and then we've got all these other areas that exist already that we can continue to see burning um, at more regular intervals and, and have that boost habitat as well. So, but thanks for asking that question. How cool. How cool that we get to have such experts with us in our community and we get to learn from them. So thank you guys one more time.